and welcome to the March or Die show today. Very glad to have you joining me, and I am super excited about the interview you are about to hear, so we're going to jump right into it in just a second. Uh, but before we get there, two quick reminders. If you have not yet subscribed to the show, please do that right now. Don't wait. Go ahead and subscribe. Uh, very important that you do that. That helps me, and that will help you so that you know when content like this is pushed out every single week. So please subscribe and then take some time. Go over to jeremystalnicker.com. Uh, that's my personal website. There you'll find my blog. You'll find contacts or uh, the connections out to all of my socials, other work that I am involved in, links out to the Mighty Oaks Foundation and the work that we do there, and uh, some other things coming soon, which I'm looking forward to talking with you about. But this conversation today, the interview that you are about to hear, is one that I've been looking forward to for a number of reasons. Uh, one is my guest, who I'll introduce here in just a second, and his personal history, which he talks about uh, during this interview. Uh, but the other one is just the story that he tells. It's an amazing story. I I'm a history guy. I, I love history. I read history. I study history, um, uh, other really than theology and and you know, kind of ministry work. Other than that, <laughs> which I read and study, uh, history is where I spend most of my time. And one of the areas I just have not known a lot about is um, the area that we're going to talk about today, the Armenian Genocide, uh, Armenian Holocaust, and, and all that took place there. Uh, you'll hear this in the interview, um, but two million Christians murdered. Uh, one and a half million of those were Armenian. This is a story that if, if you listen carefully in the news, once in a while on the periphery, there's a story about this, but uh, very few of us know really anything about it. And our guest today is uh, someone who spent a lot of time not only learning about that broadly, but very specifically a hero's story. And uh, what an unbelievable story. I won't ruin it for you. I want to, but I won't ruin it for you. But my guest today is Michael Gablack. Michael is um, a uh, film producer. He's been involved in quite a few projects in Hollywood. He'll talk some about that when he tells his story uh, in just a second. He is an author. Uh, he is a Christian, and he approaches all of this work from the perspective of being a Christian, being someone who was gifted by God, who's been given opportunities by God, and who wants to steward over those gifts and those opportunities. And he's done that certainly in the project that we're going to talk about today. But uh, very excited to share this conversation with you. I guarantee this is a conversation that is going to suck you in as he tells this story. And it's one that you'll not only enjoy, but I trust you'll learn from and be able to share out with others who will be blessed by it as well. So without further ado, my interview with guest Michael Gavlak. Michael, thank you for joining me, man. Really appreciate it. Very excited about this conversation. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Um, man, there is so much here and, uh, we were actually connected through a mutual friend and he said, I've got a friend and you need to meet him and then you need to interview him. <laughs> I said, all right. Uh, when Joel says you need to interview someone, I do it. And, um, uh, really glad that he did. Um, let's start first of all, with your story. You just, your personal story is interesting and, uh, I'd love to hear about that as well as kind of your, your faith story kind of intermingled in that because a lot of folks in your world. Uh, don't share a faith story. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, let's start there. Uh, all right. Well, first of all, how much time do we have? <laughs> I can talk. <laughs> um, I could take five hours, but I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, so I was, here's the short version. I was seven years old when I saw Star Wars. Right. So Star Wars came out. I walked in the theater as a normal seven-year-old kid, came out of the theater, life transformed. I, I'm, I'm not really actually kidding about yeah, that. Yeah, right. It was a seminal moment in my life as a seven-year-old. When I came out of that theater, I knew in my spirit that that's what I was going to do. That's, a, that's what I wanted to do. And and my life didn't go in that direction. I was um, I come from a very dysfunctional home. Uh, I was diagnosed alcoholic when I was 14. I got in, into drugs. You know, I have that kind of typical, I guess, not so, shouldn't be typical, but one of those kind of testimonies where I had a an overnight conversion when I was 18 years old. Um, my whole testimony could take another hour, but it was, I was face to face with the risen Jesus. I didn't see, I didn't see anything with my eyes or hear anything with my ears, but it was 
undeniable that Jesus was speaking to me. He walked in the room and said, you cannot serve two masters, choose who you will serve. And that was May 6th, yeah. 1988. I was 18 years old. And that's the day I was, I was transformed and, and set on the right path. It was another, another 15 years or so uh, before I actually got my foot in the door of the entertainment industry. I worked in, I, I went on the mission field. I went to actually two year um, Bible seminary. I was a youth pastor, associate youth pastor for several years. Then I decided to get an actual four year degree and I worked in a restaurant. I worked in the construction industry and I got my bachelor's degree in communications at the age of 28. Like, so I can, I started when I was 24, finished when I was 28, a late bloomer. And even then I didn't get my foot in the door. I was just following, you know, whatever God was laying out in front of me. He brought in the, the, the woman of my dreams. Like I couldn't believe it. Um, you know, the church I was mm -hmm. going to and, and, you know, God putting all those pieces together. Then I got laid off from a career that I was working and, it was that day my wife said to me, we'd been th married three years. She says, I don't want to, I don't want us to get 10 years down the road and to be the reason you didn't pursue your passion. And mm -hmm. I, I, re I remind her these days that she said that and she goes, I said that, <laughs> that doesn't sound like me. <laughs> and that's why I knew it was God, right? I knew it was, uh, God was guiding me. I had just lost my job and she comes up with that. So we ended up, mm -hmm renting out our house. We no longer own that house, but at the time we found renters. And uh, for the next two years, I buckled down and started, um, I had already started teaching myself editing software on um, Final Cut Pro. Um, it was a, you know, professional grade software at the time that had just come out. So I was teaching myself editing and I was also teaching myself screenwriting, um, proper format for screenwriting. So it's just, I was Developing, developing some skills. If that's the industry I wanted to work in, I should probably know something about it. And so it's um, long story, just a little bit longer. Somebody saw something I edited and that my first Hollywood gig, I was 35 years old, coming in, getting my foot in the door on the show called Super Nanny. I don't know if you've heard of Super Nanny, a uh, reality show about a... Yeah. A British nanny come over here to to fix some uh, poor parenting skills, and yeah. it was a, it was a hit show. Um, I worked in the casting department initially, and then I moved into the post production uh, as an assistant editor. And then from that show, uh, this is the way it works in Hollywood. You you network with people, and you would go from show to show. So one of the producers took me to another show. I became an assistant editor. Then I became an editor, and then now I'm a um, I'm a a union editor on a, uh, a very, very well-known um, uh, entertainment gossip news show. Uh, I won't mm -hmm. get into that, but I actually have one of these these things sure. now right there back in the behind me. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, it, yeah. it, so well, it was clear to yeah, me, well. you know, God got me my foot in the door and, and advanced me. Um, he gave me favor, yeah. I should say. Uh, it's one thing to know the skill set. It's another thing to be likable. And those two things combined, God uses. So I've had kind of a meteoric rise. Not like I'm famous or rich or anything, but yeah. uh, from being 35 years old, just getting my foot in the door and, and yeah. now being fairly well established. Praise the Lord. Uh, it, it, it's crazy too, really, because, you know, I said a lot of people kind of in your industry don't have a faith story. And I think one of the challenges or criticisms of Christian people in, you know, Hollywood and in the film industry or whatever, um, one of the criticisms would be, well, God gives you this talent and you're using it only for, you know, whatever, for, <laughs> for, for secular purposes and creating this content that um, doesn't glorify God necessarily. And what's interesting, I think about your story, there are a lot of things, but one of the things is God did give you those skills. You recognize that you developed those and he, he took you kind of one step to another so you could learn the things you needed to learn so that you could then get involved in a project like the one you're in right now. And what I, what I love about kind of that arc is um, you didn't say, all right, this is my thing. I can do this and I'm going to be as famous as possible it really feels like you said, God, what story do you want me to tell with the gifts, the talents, and the opportunities that you've given to me? And I, I love that about your testimony because it 
it's an example to to everyone, right? Boy, uh, and and living it, it's uh, you know, as Christians, you know, we we're like, you know, God, you've you've called us to something, right? You've, you've created us all for a reason. Yeah. We're all created for a purpose. And there's a general purpose that we all share. Yeah. To, to glorify God, right? That's mm. our purpose is to glorify God. And what does that mean? How does that translate? And we're all individuals. We're all unique and God has a, something specific. So it's the general purpose and a specific purpose. And whenever, you know, I, if people come to me for advice or career advice, one of the things I, I, I say, the first thing I say is, there's something that you do that when you're doing it, it's like time disappears, right? Everybody has preferences or, or uh, things that they're drawn to or things that they're just good at. And when they're doing it, and I don't mean playing video games or sitting down watching TV. Yeah, right, right. There's, right. there's something when you're being right. productive, when you're actually engaging the the gifts and the abilities and talents that God has given you, when you're doing it, you just lose time. That's a hint as to what God's specific calling is for you is. And that happened when I went to, when I went to that school, when I went, finally went to college, my final semester of college, I had a class or I had a classmate who was in the, there was a film emphasis. I was in communications emphasis, public address, but there was also a communications emphasis in film, TV, and radio. One of my friends that was in that program said, Hey, my senior project, I'm supposed to do a short film. And he said, he said he could do the camera work and the technical side, the post-production, but he didn't have a story. And he, he wondered if we could partner for our senior project. I went to the Dean of my department. I said, Hey, can I do a short film as my senior project? He says, absolutely. And what I was just talking about, the, the things that you are not, something that comes natural to you, it just all came naturally. And here I was in my late twenties at that time, I had never made a film or anything. I started writing, but I'd never done anything. But as soon as I was thrust into it, it all just came natural. I'm like, wait, this feels this is fun. It doesn't feel like work. And, and so then yeah. I knew, yeah. you know, and so now in Hollywood, it's, it's a, it's not like a normal job where you go and you, you get a pension and you do your 30 to 40 years and you know, mm -hmm. you go yep. show to show. Basically you're always looking for a job unless you get on one of the, you know, one of the legacy programs that'll never go away. You're always looking for a job. And uh, I had come to that um, point before I came to this project. I don't know if, if you want to go in a different direction, or if you want me to, to tell you about the project and go lead into the project and how I came yeah. to it. So, oh, so let's talk about, yeah, let's talk about that, but let's just, I, I just want to make this point for people listening, right? You have to be faithful with what God has given you and set in front of you before God brings you know, what we're going to talk about is, is crazy to me and the story is amazing. But before God brings that to you, you have to be faithful to, you know, do the work you did, right? Get on a show and just do the job and then grind it out and, and go through the process and trust God to bring you really to that place where he's going to use you, which I, I think, you know, that brings us to what you're doing now. And it's such an important, it, it's such important work. Um, that God has used your experience to get you into. So yeah, let's, let's talk about, talk about the book, talk about where that came from and um, give us a primer kind of for those that aren't uh, connected to the history of Armenia and, and a lot of the reasons this is an important story. All right. So in 2017, I was at one of those thresholds where the show was working on, I was actually a freelancer working on two separate shows. And one of those shows got discontinued, got canceled. And we had about a four to five month window lead time. I'm like, this is the last season of the show. So when we're, when we wrap, you're done. Mm. Well, because I was freelancing on two different shows and one of them was going away, that, that, that there was not enough to sustain me. This other show didn't have enough work for me. So I, I knew I had one of those transitions. So like I either have to go find, you know, you know, tap my network and, uh, you know, beat the bushes and find another gig. And, you know, that's how it works. You, you know, you, you reach out who's hiring is our new shows coming up. So I knew it was either that or, okay, God, you called me here to Hollywood for a reason. And I don't think it's just working yeah. for somebody else. I think I'm here for, you know, I've always had this sense of destiny or a sense of purpose and, and like, well, now is an opportunity to pursue that. So I, I 
set aside, I literally, I went on a, a three day um, fast. I, it was August of 2017 and or I was at early September of 2017. And I was literally my last day at work was going to be at the end of September or early, early October. So I had set aside three days, went fast, just seeking the Lord. What, you know, what do you have for me? And when you're fasting, it's not like you get an answer. Here it is. Go. You just, you're just trusting. You're, you're, you're <laughs> making a sacrifice. You're, yeah. you're just leaning in to the Lord. And I, I fasted and about a month later. Um, I had a meeting set up with a potential investor. Like I have ideas, I have scripts that I've written and story ideas, et cetera. And so I was like, all right, if I'm going to, maybe I'm supposed to go out on my own and develop something. I, I got this meeting with this potential investor and, and he didn't bite on any of the things I was pitching, but halfway through a two hour meeting, normally those meetings, it's like 45 minutes and you're done. So if it goes longer than that, yeah. you know, something good is happening. The conversation is engaging about midpoint of this two hour conversation. This guy says, out of the blue, kind of out of the blue, he says, I don't know if this is true, but my friends told me growing up, my friends told me that Armenia was the first Christian nation. And I think there's a story there from the Armenian genocide. I think an Armenian genocide movie is something that you should look into. Well, so this guy's out of the blue is saying this to me. Yeah. And those two phrases stuck with me. Like when he said them, first Christian nation, a concept that had never crossed my mind and Armenian genocide movie. So meetings done. I go to my car and I'm, a, I'm, I'm divided, right? I'm frustrated because this guy didn't invest in any of my ideas and my projects and I'm not moving on to develop my own thing. But then the other side of my mind is saying, Oh, this guy pitched an idea to me and it, it struck me. If I look into that, you know, maybe it'll go somewhere and I'll have a relationship with this guy on vest. And so I get to my car and I'm not kidding. I, I open up my phone just before going to my next stop. I open my phone just to check headlines or emails or whatever. And the very first three words that my eyes fall upon, the top story in my news feed was Armenian genocide movie. Um, wow. advertising, you know, trying to, there was some dispute as to where they could advertise because it's a political hot topic or whatever. And it was like, wait a minute. And this wasn't, it wasn't my phone listening in on this meeting, right? The guy had said Armenian <laughs> genocide movie once out of 200 or two hours, right? Out of thousands and thousands of words. It wasn't like, oh, the phone picked up that thing and then, then yeah, fed it to me. Yeah. No, this was clearly, I heard the words for the first time ever in a meeting and I, 45 minutes later, I'm sitting in my car and the first thing my eyes fall upon are those words. I'm like, okay, God, feels like you're trying to get my attention here. So immediately I texted a friend. The next day was going to be my last day at work. And it turns out this friend of mine, one of, one of my favorite coworkers that I, I work with is Armenian. It's like the only Armenian that I knew. I'm like, hey, you're Armenian, right? Tell me. So the next day at work, she pulls up Wikipedia and she pulls up. So what this guy had said in the meeting is there must be a hero from the Armenian genocide. Now, I couldn't even told you when the Armenian genocide happened. So he says there must be a hero like a Geronimo, right? A Geronimo type character, a hero among an, an oppressed, suppressed uh, minority people group, people who are mistreated. So she pulls up this picture and it's 30 guys in Bandolero bullet belts and rifles. She goes, these are my people. And I'm like, there's 30 potential Armenian Geronimos in this picture. It, I, I knew immediately there's some huge story here. And I'm a news guy. I mean, I work in the news, gossip news, but I'm, uh, I'm an investigative journalist technically. So I started digging. And the, the brief primer for anybody out there who has no idea what an Armenian is, because I, I even called my brother at that time. I said, hey, he lived in... Uh, uh, Minnesota. I'm like, he's, he's in his thirties at the time. I'm like you ever heard of an Armenian? He goes, no, yeah. he like never even heard of an Armenian. I said, Kim Kardashian he goes, Oh, okay. Mm. Right. It's like, people have no idea. <laughs> right? People have right. no idea. And, and, and so I come across the story uh, r briefly. The Ottoman empire was a Muslim ruled empire and they were a multicultural empire. They had a number of other cultures subject to them. Um, you know, Armenians, Assyrians, Greeks, Kurds, all living harmoniously within the empire. 
But uh, being a Muslim empire, they were uh, somewhat tolerant of the minorities, but there were always factions um, rising to power wanting to eradicate uh, not just the ethnic minority population, but the religious minority population, the Christians. If you were not Muslim, you were a second class citizen. You were treated as, there were laws against, yeah. you know, there were double taxation for non-Muslims and uh, you could not own firearms if you were not a Muslim. I mean, literally, these are the, the laws of the land. You're treated like a second class citizen. So under the cover of World War II, what ha or World War One, sorry, is while the West were beating the heck out of each other, the Ottoman Empire takes it upon itself to massacre the Christian minority population. And that was some 2 million Christians. And the reason we refer to it as the Armenian Genocide is 1.5 million out of those 2 million were ethnically Armenians. But they weren't just targeting Armenians. They, that was the main population, but there were about 300,000 Christian Greeks, about 200,000 uh, Christian Assyrians, and then in, Kurds were split down the middle between Muslim and Christian, so there, uh, any Christian Kurds were also massacred uh, in this genocide. It, it was wasn't it, it was technically a genocide, but the word genocide hadn't even been coined yet, and so um, I went into I can fast forward uh, just to summarize. It was referred to as a, a Holocaust, and it was the Christian Holocaust of World War I. And it was literally what Hitler modeled his Holocaust after. And, and this story yeah. ties those two uh, genocides together. Um, and we can get into more details, but uh, take it where you want to go. There's a hero story that I discovered that gonna, yeah. that's going to blow this whole thing open. So, you know, most people, and we talked about this even before we started, I was talking to my high school kids today and asking them what they know about the Armenian genocide. And they're like, the what and when and what are you talking about, <laughs> right? And I think that's most people. Um, but man, such an important piece of history, and particularly for Christian people, it's a very important piece of just world history that we're not aware of. And um, there's a lot wrapped up in that. Why is this such a... Secret's not the right word because it's it's in the open, but maybe it's an open secret. Why is this something we don't know about or don't talk about? Well, even my pagan secular uncle, I've heard him concede the fact that Christians have suffered more than any other group through history. You know, my 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 secular, mm. uh, very well educated uncle acknowledges the fact Christians have been targeted more than any other group. Uh, in uh, since Christianity had sprang to life, and that's pretty much the promise, yeah. Yeah, the promise of Christ. You know, all men will persecute you because of me, yeah. and yeah. it's because right. Christians thrive and prosper and are happy when they just apply the principles of the gospel. Right, love one another is all about uh, living harmoniously together on this planet that got this gorgeous, amazing planet that God designed. Right, and when there's some other uh, ideology that wants to take preeminence, its number one uh, competitor is Christianity, because everybody who tries Christianity loves it and thrives. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's sure. and it's also satanic and demonic, right? So it's, uh, Satan knows his time is limited. And so any chance he gets, he wants to try and destroy God's people. Yeah. So, and the re and so those are some of the reasons. The specific reasons that the Armenian genocide has been suppressed um, are are numerous, and some of those are these. Um, in 1933, uh, MGM Pictures had a movie in production called um, Musa Dog. There's a famous battle from World War One in the Ottoman Empire during the genocide. Uh, Musa Dog was a region where some Armenians resisted and were able to escape. And it's this heroic story. And there was a movie in production at MGM Studios. And then the State Department of the Republic of Turkey reached out to the State Department of the United States and said, if you want to maintain diplomatic relations with us, you have to shut down that Hollywood production. And the State Department of the United States stepped in and quashed this important story. And that's just one example of many. Um, wow. The Armenian genocide or this Christian Holocaust 
technically concluded in, in 1923. A lot of people would say it's in, in 1918 at the end of World War One, but no, the, the Americans got out of the war and the war was quote unquote done, but the massacres continue, continue, continued until 1923. And that was when the Republic of Turkey was established as you know the modern Republic, Republic of Turkey. It just celebrated its, its centennial. But they established their republic on the blood of massacred Christians. And so it's an embarrassing historic event in their history that they have not acknowledged. Uh, Germany has acknowledged what they did, right? But Turkey to this day yep. continues the genocide. What Turkey did is um, Mustafa Kemal was the uh, founding president of the modern Republic of Turkey. And one of the things he did is he changed their alphabet. He changed the Turkish alphabet from Arabic to Latin script and then expunged every reference from Armenians from their history. So from that point on, in 1923 forward, anybody who learned Turkish history would not learn a thing about Armenians. They would think there was no such thing as Armenians. They literally wrote Armenians out of history. And that's a part of genocide. If you look up what genocide is, there's five factors in what genocide is. It's not just massacring a people. Uh, genocide is only successful when memory of that culture ceases to exist. Right. And so it's this continued genocide over 100 years referred to as denialism. And I've worked with academics on both Turkish historians and Armenian historians. And I asked them, I said, so is this um, dispute about this Armenian genocide in academia? Is it kind of 50 50? Are there are there uh, experts on both sides? And they're like, no, 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 no. It's just a very few historians who are paid off by the government of Turkey that deny this happened. All of academia agrees yeah. that this happened, but it's been suppressed by by forces like the United States and Germany was complicit as well in the, in the Ottoman Empire and in Turkey. The Ottoman Empire came to an end at the end of World War One, and that was the birth of the Republic of Turkey. So I'm learning a lot of history and I don't want to bore people with history, yeah. but but history is what's the what's the the trope we always hear? If you don't learn history, you're doomed to repeat it. Yeah. And, and That's right. this this project has uh I mean, that's kind of the resounding theme of this project. How are we going to get people interested in history? If you don't learn history, you're doomed to repeat it. And nobody goes out and learns history when they hear that. Well, how do we make it interesting? Well, Hollywood has a responsibility. And that's where I, I realized that God put me in this place in the heart of Hollywood. I'm like one step removed from a bunch of A-listers, right? I mean, the the I'm re I live in a neighborhood with really influential people, et cetera. And some are personal friends of mine. Yeah. It's like, God, you put me here for a reason. And it's not just to tell these nonsense stories. It's to find the stories that will bring history to life. And God brought, God dropped one, a huge hero story in my lap. Sogelman Talarian. That's so the name. The, the, yeah. The, so the, the book you wrote is Assassin Saints, uh, the story of Solomon Talarian. And I've been practicing that name all morning because um, <laughs> how it's said is not how it's spelled. But um, Solomon Talarian, man, what an unbelievable story. And, you know, normally our hero stories end with the hero and then he died in a hail of bullets or something. This this story, it's 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 not at all what you think. Um, I want people to to get the book and to follow you and to support the movie when it comes out. But with whatever you're comfortable telling. Um, Tell us why this captured you and, and what makes this such an incredible story. Okay. Now, like I said, back in uh, 20, 2017, when I saw that window closing where I need to find another gig and I fasted and I had this meeting and I, I had an Armenian friend at work that pointed me in this direction. So about a week or so after that, you know, my friend point taking me to Wikipedia. Um, I'm just researching because in Hollywood, the story has to have a happy ending, right? Most, all the successful films, right. there's a happy ending. There's a justice. There's some kind of resolution. I mean, there's only two types of films, right? This is that, that typical film school uh, argument. How many, how many genres of film are there? There's two, there's comedies and tragedies, right? And that doesn't mean comedies are slapstick. It means a happy ending or a sad ending. Comedies are the happy endings. Tragedies are the sad endings. And the tragedies almost never make money, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, some people make their yeah. existential right. films and right. they have no real resolution and it's artistic or whatever and it wins <laughs> awards. But the ones that people want to see are the heroes winning. 
right? Justice prevailing. Yeah. And that's just ingrained in us because we know as Christians in, in particular that we win. We're already like we've won. The victory is mm-hmm. won and we know that God prevails. And so those stories from history are reflections of what God is doing. And so it, it's just our natural inclination. We want to see justice prevail because we know it does. So I'm digging. I'm like, Armenian genocide, this, it's been suppressed for 100 years. This is a million, uh, 1.5 million Armenians massacred, 2 million Christians wiped out. Where's the happy ending in this? Where? And, and, and so, you know, Hollywood, one of the techniques is let's, let's create a character, right? Let's create something and let's fabricate yeah. some things or, yeah. or make an amalgam of different characters and different things. So I started looking at different heroic stories and, and then I come across this one little detail that just solved the problem. It was just one little detail. The the guy who is considered by historians unanimously as the architect of the Armenian genocide, or specifically the architect of the Christian Holocaust, is a guy named Talat, Talat Pasha. And, and Pasha is a title, like Lord or master or right pasha is a is a uh, a title of of prominence of elite so there are a lot of pashas but his name was mehmet talat pasha and he during the war was the minister of the interior which means he actually had total control over the nation of the infrastructure of the people of the population like it was the most powerful position there was a grand vizier as kind of a figurehead he ended up rising to that position but talat pasha is universally acknowledged as the guy who pulled the trigger the guy who said let's let's do it this is the policy let's massacre armenians let's deport them into uh, oblivion and then we found the orders the telegraphs that were sent and so this is the guy who is responsible i come across this wikipedia detail talat pasha assassinated by armenian student goes on trial and is acquitted. I'm like, wait, 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 what? Yeah. <laughs> wait, 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 what? <laughs> yeah. So to put it in perspective, imagine a Jewish kid escaping the Jewish Holocaust, tracking down Adolf Hitler, who was being harbored, like imagine that Hitler had escaped Germany, it was being harbored by some allied nation. Imagine a Jewish kid tracking down Hitler, who was being protected by a foreign nation, tracking him down and putting a bullet in his brain and surrendering to police and going on trial in that foreign nation that was harboring the enemy. And then that foreign nation acquitting that Jewish kid who killed Hitler. Well, that scenario I just described is exactly what happened 25 years before Hitler. There's an Armenian kid whose entire family was massacred. And I mean, there's a lot to the story, but he has, he has a vision. I'll get into a little of the details. So Solomon Talerian uh, was, he was, he, he left the Ottoman empire just prior to world war one, because, because of the suppression of Armenians within the Ottoman empire, it, the the young men would leave before they turned 18 because they'd be conscripted in the military. They'd go to a foreign country and start working and sending money home, right? The, the families, it's their land. Armenia has been there for thousands and thousands of years. Like it predates yeah. Christendom. It, it Armenian culture goes back four to 5,000 years. So they didn't want to leave their land. They would send money back to their home. So Sogman Tulirin gets out goes to Serbia where his father and his brothers were. Now his mother and his, his nieces and nephews were all back in, in the Ottoman Empire. Then the war starts and that's the end, right? They never get, at, they never get back there. Sogomon joins the uh, Armenian volunteers. And in, in this time of history, our, uh, Russia was a Christian nation, right? So Russia was a Christian nation. The Ottoman Empire was a Muslim nation. So they were at odds with each other. And Armenia, historic Armenia, straddled the two empires. Armenia mm. predated both of those empires as a culture, but when the Russian Empire and the, and the Ottoman Empire came to prominence, Armenia was divided down the middle. So you had half Russian Armenians, half Ottoman Armenians. And so it was like dividing uh, when war was declared, when the Ottomans sided with Germany against Russia, uh, it, it split Armenia down the middle. So all these Armenians from around the world went to the Russian side as volunteers. And Sogomon Talerian found himself volunteering. And they were winning on the, on the far eastern front where the Russian and Ottoman border was. The Armenians were at the front lines and the Russian army was behind them. And they were massacred. I mean, they were pushing back the Turkish, the Ottoman army 
uh, rapidly. It was like they were melting away, partly because the Armenians knew the terrain. It was like their home land, home country. They knew the terrain, but also the Turks were ordered to retreat and massacre every Armenian in their wake. So they were retreating and massacring as they were retreating as fast as they yeah. could. And so the, so Sogamun got to see the massacres firsthand as the front line. And he, he made it all the way to his home, which was like in the middle of the Ottoman empire. And his, his house had been converted to a military barracks. Um, and he never wow. saw any of his, uh, of, of 85 family members, uh, 79 of them were massacred. His father and brothers wow. and one niece. He found one niece that they rescued. So long story short, the Russian Bolshevik revolution happened in the midst of this. So the Russians abandoned the effort. So the Armenians thought they were getting their country back and with the Russians behind them. But back home in Russia, Russia was undergoing the Bolshevik revolution. And so all these Russian military guys, why are we fighting for this foreign land when our homes are threatened at home? And so the Armenians who thought they were about to win and get their, their land back were abandoned by the major Russian army. And so here's Sogomon having to retreat after all of the hope of regaining. And so he goes back to uh, when the war ends, the Turkish advance stops. And so there's this little sliver of Armenia left. It was Russian, technically Russian Armenia. Sogomun starts rescuing orphans. Im imagine you have this massacre where the, the police, the Ottoman military and police, and they were releasing criminals from jail. And they say, go freely plunder and rape and pillage and murder Armenians. They're, they're free, free, free game. So the, the, the survivors of this massacre were the youngest of the youngest who fled into the, into the countryside. And they became like feral children. So Sogomon becomes the head orphan gatherer. So like <laughs> speaking of heroic, he lost his whole family. He was trying yeah. to get back to his mother and, and all hope is lost. And he does the only thing that makes sense to him, try to rescue the remnants of the Armenian people. To this day, just about every Armenian I come across in the world has a dramatic story of being rescued from this massacre. And Sogomon was the head orphan gatherer. So he's this larger than life hero who's just a normal kid. And then I'll just, long story short, he, long story, a little longer. He tracks down, he ends up, he has a vision, right? And this is where I, as a Christian, am seeing the story as, as a secular historian can't see it. Sogomon wrote his own memoir. And, uh, and it had never been translated into English until I came across it. It was, had never been translated into English. It's a guy who went on trial and was acquitted for assassinating a world leader, wrote his story, and it had never been translated until I got the top translator from Armenian to English to, to do it. He's like a renowned translator. It was an, the honor of his life to transfer, translate this, this national hero story. Yeah. And the reason I was just chomping at the bit to get this thing translated is because up to that point, all I had access to was Sogomon's court transcript. He went on trial in Germany, a modern Western court. And that German transcript had been translated into English. And in the testimony, when the judge asked Sogomon Tolerian, why did you assassinate Talat Pasha? Sogomon Tolerian on the record says, my mother's ghost told me that I couldn't be with her in heaven until I did this. I'm like, okay, he's testifying in court that a ghost, that his mother's ghost told him to do this. And, and like, this is before I had his memoir translated. I'm like, I know he, there were certain things fabricated in the defense testimony. There just were, there were things that they, they fabricated to make him appealing to the jury or whatever. But that one thing stuck with him. I don't think he would fabricate that, that his mother's ghost appeared to him. So once I got the memoir translated, it's all through the memoir. He had these, um, we would call them night terrors. Uh, they would be attributed maybe to post-traumatic stress disorder. These are ways that, are, that, that this would be psycho, psychoanalyzed today. But the fact of the matter is Sogomon had a regular yeah. connection across the threshold. His mother was a, pa a preacher's daughter. So he was a grandson of a preacher man. He was a, they grew up in a Christian culture. He had the, uh, the Lord's prayer memorized since he was like seven years old. It's like, it's just ingrained in their culture. And when I read his accounts of 
his mother's ghost appearing to him and him having these visions of his dead relatives and other people that died. There were people that died that he didn't know he had died yet, that he had visions of. And then a week or two later, he'd find out that they had just died in the war. So he was given this glimpse across the threshold and he had a vision around the time when he was the orphan gatherer of assassinating Talat. He's like, he's like, this guy has to pay for this. And nobody was holding him accountable. Fast forward six years through a series of miracles that he documents in his memoir. He gets connected to a larger uh, um, political organization scheme. Um, a lot of people think Sogelman was a lone gunman. And he had to testify in court that he was a lone gunman because if he had he acknowledged the conspiracy, he would have been put to death right. because of political right. conspiracy. So people believe he was a lone gunman, but he was actually ordered by his government. Think of SEAL Team 6 going in to get Osama bin Laden, right? Osama bin Laden's being harbored by a hostile foreign nation, Pakistan. And they're not going to bring Osama bin Laden to justice, right? Using a, a more recent example. This is the exact same scenario. Sogolman Talirian, the, the enemy of the Armenian people, of the perpetrator of the Christian Holocaust of World War I, was being harbored in Berlin, Germany, living freely uh, to go about his go about his day and plan for his return. He was planning a return to the leadership of Turkey. And Sogolman Talirian was inserted by a spy network. He found an apartment directly across the street. He found Talat, found his 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 uh, his behavior pattern, his his uh, daily walk, and he when he got the green light, pulled the trigger, and then went on trial. and And this is the this is the savior story, right? He's a savior of his people, right? Uh, he represents all of these massacred people, and he's there to bring justice. And and Sogolman. Didn't know that he would survive. He didn't know he would be acquitted. It didn't matter to him. This was something that he would sacrifice yeah. himself for. And so he laid down his life. And then he and then he gets acquitted. And the cap of everything is he gets the girl in the end. It's literally he fell in love with a girl before the war. <laughs> he fell in love with this girl before the war. And he's like, I have to go off after the war. She she said, Where are you going? He couldn't tell her, I have to go assassinate this guy. She's like, Where are you going? And he's like, I have something to do. And he goes, he goes, will you wait for me? It, literally, he's like, will you wait for me? And she puts her, he describes it. She puts her hands on her hips and says, we'll, we'll see who waits for who. So he goes into the belly of the beast, into Berlin, Germany, assassinates yeah. Talat, goes on trial, gets acquitted, and then gets to marry the girl in the end. <laughs> it's like, it's the Hollywood ending of Hollywood endings. And it's actually yeah. uh, accurate history. It's not, I didn't fabricate any of this. It's all like a real story. And um, let me just tell you a little bit about what this is. Assassin Saint, you can go to assassinsaint.com. Uh, within the next few days, you'll actually be able to purchase this. The digital version will be available. Um, and then the hard copy version will be available soon after that. Um, and that the, the pricing and whatever, that'll all be on assassinsaint.com. If you go there right now, you just see what you have back here. Um, and what this is, is an academic curriculum and a Hollywood lookbook. Um, so yeah. if anybody knows what Hollywood, if you're going to pitch an idea to raise funds and get collaborators, you come up with something called the lookbook, which shows, you know, gives an impression or an idea to those investors and collaborators what it looks like. So what I've done is I've I've taken the this is the first act of the script, and I have put the script in here, but I've also put the pictures of the actual characters whenever they're speaking over here they're highlighted on this page you have the locations where everything happened you have the timeline of when it happened and this has been signed off on by uh, georgetown historians so this is an academic curriculum when you read this you'll be learning accurate history but you'll also be uh, visualizing an incredibly compelling story that god wrote right this is one of those things that, that yeah. has been suppressed up until such a time as this as you can tell, I could keep going on and on. Yeah, man, that's such an incredible story. And uh, I love the way you've laid it out in the book. Um, I, I guess there's a lot of questions I could ask, but I, I would imagine as you work through this, and this is, you know, so much research and so many conversations and so much exposure and a lot of traveling and all the things that you did, there had to have been a point where you stepped back and, and for you personally, maybe I'm wrong, but 
where there was a moment where you're like, this is the big lesson, or this is, if there's a takeaway that I want people to get a hold of, this is, this is why I have to tell this story. People need to do this in response to this story. Um, what's the big takeaway? What, other than it just being interesting, is fascinating. Um, <laughs> whether you're a student of history or not, what a fascinating story. But what are you hoping people will do in response to it? What this do, what this story has done in my life, um, and I think it seems that everybody I tell about the story has the similar reaction or the uh, agreement is um, kind of my sign off. A lot of times when I do um, podcasts or videos or YouTube, my sign off has been God is in control, and it's mm. it's um, God's sovereignty. And a lot of people think, you know, people only think God is in control when things go the way we want them to go, right? It's like, oh, my guy won the election or this happened or that happened. Yeah. God is in control. But no, no, God is in control of everything. He's not surprised by who won the election. He's not surprised by a genocide. He's not surprised by these things. He's not surprised by the horrific things that happen. In fact, he promises them. Like you look in the Old Testament and, you know, I was just reading Solomon uh, in the Lord after they dedicated the first temple, you know, the God, the temple that man, that God said he would build. And after the, the glory of the Lord fills the temple and Solomon says his prayer and God appears to Solomon alone. And he says, as long as you serve me and worship me, et cetera, all things are going to go well and you'll prosper, et cetera. But when you turn from me, here's what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. All these horrible things. Yeah. And they we, we got the history. We got first and second Kings. We got first and second Chronicles. We've got they turn and those horrific things happen when people turn from God. But what this story has showed me is that God is continually at work all the time, everywhere. Um, you know, we grew up in a if we went to secular school, we grew up learning certain types of history. But then we go on Sunday, we learn a different kind of history. It's like, oh, God was doing certain things that were more important than all this right. other history you learned. Right. So God is constantly at work in the affairs of humans all the time. Why this story, I believe, is so significant is because it's the first Christian nation. And when Jesus mm -hmm. said, go and make disciples of all nations, right, the last marching orders he gives the great commission go and make disciples of all nations well in the most literal textually accurate uh understanding of that make disciples of nations means to that the nations will convert right like israel was supposed to be god's people and there was a time when they all serve god and as, as harmonious a unit that's god's plan for corporate bodies god jesus came to bring individual salvation, but a part of God's plan seems to be corporate salvation. There, there are groups, and not doesn't mean that every person in that society that converts to Christianity is a Bible-believing Christian, but when a culture adopts the teaching of Christianity, that culture thrives. Mm -hmm. And Armenia, even your secular historians will acknowledge and say this, Armenia was the first Christian nation. And so it's that phrase, first Christian nation, that stood out to me. I'm like, wait a minute. We as Christians are missing this. We don't even know our own history. And since Armenia was the first yeah. fulfillment yeah. of the Great Commission in that sense, it's literally the first example. It was about a couple decades later that the Roman Empire declared Christianity, the, the, the law of the land. Sure. And so all of those other cultures within the Roman Empire, there's a, like a domino effect, but it was Armenia itself. And, it, and Armenia's conversion story is a miraculous story as well. And I could go into that, but the, the fact that there was a first Christian nation should shock the sensibilities of modern Christians because we are guilty of not learning our own history. Our own history is more important than any other history we learn. And so by, by coming across a heroic story, a dramatic heroic story uh, of, of God's deliverance of, of justice and justice coming to the perpetrator from the first Christian nation, just by telling this history, I don't have to preach anything. I just have to tell the accurate history. This is, yep. these are believing Christians who are massacred for their faith. 
And every secular historian agrees to that, right? It's, it's an earth shattering revelation that has been actively suppressed for, for uh, several generations by the powers that be. But we live in a time now that it can no longer be suppressed because of the example that you and I are able to communicate like this freely. You don't have to depend on the studio system. You don't have to depend on any of those systems. You can do it yourself. And, and this is, it's what's happening. It's, it's this groundswell moment. There's been like, uh, Sound of Freedom was an example. The Passion of the Christ is an example. Uh, the Chosen. These are examples of independent productions that are taking over, yeah. right? It's a starved audience, the Christian community. If I start talking about the first Christian nation and this hero, Christians are going to be like, what? How, did, how come I didn't know this? They'll flock to this. <laughs> so this is the, the beginning of the beginning of it all. Man, that's so incredible. Um, you're right about our history too. And I think, you know, it's even worse for those of us in the West, right? Not only do we not know Christian history, all we care about is what happened, like, you know, basically since 1776 or something. And we think we're the only, we're the first Christian nation, right? And I mean, people talk about that and say that, and, and there's so much more behind that. And so many people have given their lives to stand up for the truth of, you know, God and his word. And for us not to know that, man, what an important work Uh, other than, um, and we'll give the website again, but other than assassinsaint.com, where can people follow you? And, and I know there's a lot more coming on this and, you know, maybe that will take some time, but where can people follow the work that you're doing? Well, there's a couple of places. I have a lot of, um, one of the things that I've been doing consistently for the last two years um, is uh, I created a Bible every morning uh, YouTube channel. Um, it's actually on, uh, actually our friend, our mutual friend, Joel, um, started a, a website yeah. called Christian podcast central. And so yeah. I've kind of taken over the YouTube side of Christian podcast central just by doing it, um, every morning, um, a Bible every morning. So I have an app that I, we play about four chapters of the Bible every morning. So the first 10 to 15 minutes of the episode are just listening to the word of God and it's on screen so you can read it. And then I do commentary. I'll, I'll take notes while I'm listening and I'll do, you know, just cause I have some seminary level education. I worked in ministry. And so I, one of the things I think that qualifies for me for this story is I understand Christian history, I understand theology. And so, um, by, uh, putting the word of God first in my life, uh, you can't go wrong. I mean, your life only improves because we're going to have eternity to learn yeah. the word of God. Yeah. So if people want to join on a daily basis, I do about 10 minutes of commentary after the Bible reading. It's on Christian Podcast Central, um, Bible every morning. You can't miss it when you go there. Awesome. Um, and then through the Assassin Saint website is we're going to have a mailing list up there when if people want to be updated on the progression of things, because I'm about to do a book tour. I'm like setting all this up now. The book, um, this is a prototype. The book is actually going to be printed, but I did a limited edition printing. If you can see the numbers on the side, I did the limited edition. Um, I've been working with Sogolman Talerian's family, like the 94 year old son of Sogolman Talerian autographed these books. Like, like, there's his autograph right there. I got this done in, in November. Wow. Um, and I'm announcing it here. He actually just passed away yesterday. Yesterday. Oh, no kidding. No wow. kidding. Wow. So. Wow. Unbelievable. Well, Michael, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll talk more um, as, you know, kind of the story develops and you produce more great content, but thank you for doing this. Thank you for really, I would say this, thank you for letting God use you to tell such an important story. Um, it's great to be able to kind of walk through it. So thank you. Jeremy, thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to seeing you again because this is what happens. Like I, I, it's this network of friends that are growing like-minded yes. believers and patriots and people just wanting to bring justice. And so I look forward to the next time we see each other. What an amazing story. I um, I was familiar with this story as I've been preparing for this interview. Uh, I mentioned in the interview that Michael and I were connected through a mutual friend. And um, uh, our friend Joel, he started telling me the story. And I, I just, I, I was not uh, as knowledgeable, as educated on um, the Armenian genocide and, and all that took place and the scope of all of that, not nearly as uh, educated as I'd hoped to be, would like to be. 
um, began to research that and look into it. And then to hear the story uh, that Michael just told, uh, man, what what an amazing story. So many incredible lessons there. And I'm very glad that we were able to um, have the conversation, but also discuss the takeaways and, and the big takeaway. God is in control and he is in control. That God is outside of our space and time, that he understands things very differently than we do. And as we are able to step back and, and gain an historical perspective, we can learn so many of the lessons that uh, we're able to learn through these stories, but lessons that we can apply to our own lives about trust, about confidence, about hope, and uh, really looking to God in the midst of deep, deep trial and, uh, and tragedy in so many ways. So very thankful for this conversation and the opportunity to share it with you. Please go and check out assassinsaint.com. And uh, you can find uh, Michael's work there, and you'll be blessed by that. Take some time. Go over to Life Audio, lifeaudio.com. You can find not only my podcast, you're listening to it right now. You don't need to find mine, but it's there, but also other great podcasts as well. And I would encourage you to go and check that out as well. Thank you so much for listening. I trust that you were encouraged and blessed by the conversation. Please share this out with others, and we will talk to you next time. Many of our veterans feel they need to fight their battles alone. This self-isolation has led to the staggering statistic of more than 20 veterans taking their lives every day. The mission of Mighty Oaks is to eradicate the veteran suicide epidemic and help our warriors change their legacies. We've been able to help over 4,000 veterans and first responders by equipping them with the tools they need to live the lives they were created to live. Our faith-based, peer-to-peer approach has one of the highest success rates of any program available today, offering hope and understanding to those who need it most. By aligning their lives to biblical principles, these men and women are able to lead their families, their communities, and our nation. It's your generosity that can make a difference in the lives of the men and women who have fought for our country and our freedoms. Now that they're home, don't let them fight alone. Learn more at MightyOaksPrograms.org.